All right, you're good, Kathy. Good afternoon, everyone. This is the March 9th meeting of the Joint Capital Planning Committee. Um, I'm Kathy Shane, the chair, and because we're conducting this virtually, my first order of business needs to make sure everyone can hear and be heard of the committee members. We have a quorum. In fact, only one member is missing right now. Um, so I'll just call out your name and indicate whether all systems are go. Pam? Here. Farah? Here. Jennifer? Here. Irv? Here. Mandy? Present. And Kathy is here. And Alex said she may be phoning in with a phone. So uh, Sean can monitor that. Sean, I think I'm turning it over to you so you can, uh, we, we have uh, a wealth of participants today, um, dignified members of the town staff. Thank you all. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna let you uh, tell us what the order is. I don't know whether it's the order that they were listed or it's up to you. Okay. Over um, and I think we have Alex in the audience. Um, so Alex said she was gonna call in today. So we have a phone number in the audience. Um, yeah, so you want me to double can, check that that's her? her yeah, idea. the last four numbers are 8312. Uh, if anyone knows far, uh, Alex's number. Yes, that's it. That's okay. Alex. So Alex, if you just, if you do want to raise your hand or anything like that later, we'll keep an eye out for that. Um, so the first department going today is planning and uh, planning director Christine Brestrup is here to speak to the one, uh, one project in that department. Um, and I will turn it over to you, Christine. Thank you. I was uh, needing to unmute myself. Um, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to meet with you. My name is Christine Brestrup, and I'm in the planning department. Um, I have one request, which is for $50,000 for various consultants. And um, last year, we asked for um, consultancy money. And so far, we've used about $28,000 of last year's funds to hire a consultant to evaluate the Boltwood Garage. So that's a, a very successful project. And we should be seeing results from that soon. Um, this year, I'm asking for, um, again, $50,000. But I have three different ideas of how to use it. And as time goes on, we'll figure out which one or two of those projects makes the most sense. The first one is um, East Amherst Village Center. Um, that seems to be getting an awful lot of interest lately. Um, we have the Fort River School that's coming um, uh, into, into view. Um, the East Street School is uh, going to be um, converted into affordable housing by Wayfinders. We have a MassWorks grant to, um, to work on sidewalks along Belchertown Road. Um, ServiceNet just got uh, permission to build um, 12 units of housing for um, very low income. And some of them are formerly homeless people at 20 Belchertown Road. And Amir Mikchi is um, continuing construction on Southeast Common and is planning a new project across Southeast Street from that. So we think that there's a lot of activity going on there. In addition to that, the planning board met recently to talk about um, places that they thought housing could go. And one of the places that they zeroed in on was the East Amherst Village Center. So we would like to um, be able to hire a consultant to study existing conditions and think about proposed development um, concepts and um, talk about potential zoning changes that might be needed there and also infrastructure changes if any are needed. So that would be our um, kind of our highest priority. Uh, the second possible project is um, affordable housing pre-development studies. And we'd like to be able to evaluate properties for potential affordable housing development. Right now we're evaluating a property up on Strong Street, um, but we're kind of having to use a patchwork of funds to do that. So it would be nice to have some money read, readily available so that we could hire a consultant to do a survey or map wetlands or do a quick sketch of where housing could go on a certain property. We always have these things that kind of come out of the blue at us and, and we'd like to be able to respond. And the third one, uh, that we have in our um, in our list here is evaluating various 
properties downtown in the downtown area. And this is something that's come up before um, for potential um, parking garages. We have the ability to, um, well, how should I say this? We, we changed zoning recently to allow a parking garage to occur um, on a property on North Prospect Street. Um, some people don't like that location and we've been asked to look at other locations and we think it would be helpful to have a consultant to do that so um, one or two of these projects could move ahead if we had um, that fifty thousand dollars to um, to use in the in the coming year in fy24 Sean, I assume we're going to take questions um, since Chris just says, well, we'll do questions of this before we move to the next, correct? Yeah. Um, Chris, are you all, are you, are you done with um, your yes, project? Yes, thank you. Yeah. I think the one thing I'll just add quickly to uh, what Chris presented is last year, we decided to make this sort of a recurring item similar to some of the other departments that have recurring items. Um, and the reason being that there's always things that pop up in a given year. Um, so again, as Chris mentioned last time, it was doing a study of the parking garage in Boltwood. I think we were, there was also thought, Chris, right, of using some of that for solar, mm -hmm. um, to support right. the solar bylaw. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So again, the seeing what planning has to take on, we thought it made sense to sort of have this recurring amount each year for them. Mm -hmm. So we're open for questions. Mandy. Thank you, Chris, for the summary of what you hope to use it for. Um, two questions, and they're kind of related to each other. Um, the East Amherst Village, I think, project, in, in my mind, makes the most sense of the three you mentioned to do something with, because um, it has a lot of projects going on and all. Um, but my question with that one is, you didn't mention things like design guidelines or form-based zoning in that study. Um, and I know we had an RFP proposal or something that was funded, I think through JCPC or leftover capital um, things a year or two ago. And how would that fit into something like an East Amherst Village rezoning sort of study? Or is that solely focused on the downtown? And would we need to do, would an East Amherst study need more um, need its own sort of design guidelines or form-based zoning if we were looking at that? So yes, we do have $100,000 for design guidelines and we recently got another 75,000 from the state. So we have 175,000. We're working on redoing the, or updating the um, RFP for that. And we're hoping to put that out very soon, but that is specifically um, related to the downtown, to streetscape and building design in the downtown. There may be aspects of that study that would um, be able to be transported to village centers, but we're not really sure right now. And I think um, the amount of money that we're talking about, the $50,000, that's not going to... Um, you know, if we use, even if we used all of it, I don't think that's going to give us everything we need to put in place a plan for East Amherst Village Center. It's going to be a start, you know, because we haven't really thought about it except internally here in the past. And so, you know, we need to kind of talk to a consultant about what's possible here. What do you, um, what do you think we could actually do? There are a lot of um, constraints um, existing infrastructure, wetlands, et cetera. So we kind of need somebody to help us look at the whole area. And then, you know, once we've looked at that and gotten a sense of what's possible, then we could move on to more specific studies, such as you were talking about, Mandy. Thanks. So I'm, I'm looking for other hands if I, I don't see anyone. So I have a question, um, Chris, I'll, let, I'll take Farah first. Go ahead. Um, thanks. Uh, Christine, just a quick question. You mentioned there was a project in the South Amherst Common. I'm just curious as to what that is. Oh, easy. It's that you mentioned Southeast Street. Oh, Southeast Street. So um, um, a gentleman named Amir McChee is developing a building right behind the Florence Savings Bank, and he's calling it Southeast Common. And that's named oh. after Southeast Street, where the building is located. So oh. he's um, he's gotten pretty far with that building, and now he's proposing to build a similar building uh, a little taller across the street. Um, there are three small houses there. It's kind of in back of Auto Express. So he's been talking to us about that for a long time. We, I haven't seen any recent plans, so I don't know exactly what it is, but 
um, I think it's my memory is like 50 units and it's four stories high, but that's about as much as I know about it. Thank you. So Chris, my, my question is also on this area and I think focusing on that makes sense. I know you're short staffed or you, maybe the good news is you've rehired, but um, there are the intersections both uh, on the south end and on the north end by the school um, the current school are problematic. And I I think the you got mass works for the sidewalks, but I'm wondering if you would want to focus on initial ideas of what we would want in each of those two intersections and whether there's any possibility of having the road uh, along the Fort River expanse be one lane wider and I know it's problematic because of where the commons is but have the consultant focus on that to help write a grant proposal is what, what I'm looking at you know to be, be thinking of this is not just conceptual because there is you and I were both on a phone call where there is a grant program called busy intersection near school is the the title of the grant program and so it's a a pretty good fit <laughs> with uh, this intersection but but with the housing coming in that was one of the things that helped with Pomeroy having people say more people are going to be living there and so ease the congestion with safe ways to ride a bike safe ways to walk so it's just a um could a lot of this focus on that, and it sounded like you said you used 20 of last year's, so maybe there's 30 left of last year's, but is that enough to sort of get some help with writing a, um, a grant proposal? So that's my question on that one. So of last year's money, I think we've used 28 for the um, study of the Boltwood garage, so that means we have about 22 left, and we're um, kind of holding that uh, in for the potential that we may need some help with the solar bylaw. Okay. Um, but if we didn't use it for the solar bylaw, then it would be available for something else. I think that um, it's a good idea to study Southeast Street in front of Fort River School, but I'm not sure that it's part, it's, it's, I think what I'm thinking of is a broader look at the whole East Amherst area, all the way from, you know, where the, um, what do you call it? The Wemco building is, you know, maybe all the way down to um, the Maplewood Farms. I mean, that whole area, really look at it and say, how is this being used now? How could it be used? I think some of the zoning there is archaic and it's preventing people from doing things that they want to do. Um, so that's more in line with what I'm having a concept about. I think that the, the roadway issue is really something, you know, maybe we could get some mass works money to do that. Maybe we could work with the DPW and they could come up with a plan. So it's really uh, kind of, it's adjacent to the area that we're studying, but it's not the core of the area that we're studying. Does that answer your question? Yeah, completely. Thank you. Kathy, so um, I think Alex has her, has had her hand up. Is it okay if I Allow her absolutely, to talk. absolutely. Okay, Alex, I'm going to allow you to talk. You're um, on, Alex. You just have to unmute. All right, you're, you're unmuted. Okay, can you hear me? Kind of. Can you say, speak again? Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, a I'm having bit, trouble. Slightly I've, garbled. How about now? Is now better? Yes. Totally. <laughs> we lost you a little bit, Alex, in terms of your volume. Sorry, is that better? Yes, that's better. Okay, sorry. Um, I just had a, a procedural question. Um, Sean, as you had said, we started adding this $50,000 for planning last year. So this is the second year. And I guess I want to understand the role of JCPC relative to sort of when, you know, these, these sort of buckets of money that didn't used to exist, whether it's for sustainability or for planning, you know, is our role, like, are we expecting for people to bring us projects that we then, you know, bring feedback around prioritization? Or is it really just that we're you know, approving an amount. And at the end of the day, those departments are going to make the decisions based on what they think is best. So I'm just trying to figure out sort of what 
yeah. what our um, role is. So I would say generally you're approving an amount because we're not proposing a specific project. So you're 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 approving an amount, and I think your role is to you know as part of this process to hear what we've done in the past and decide if you think that money is allocated you know for a good purpose. So like with sustainability, you know we brought a list of what that was used on for FY twenty three. If you you know agree that's a good use of those funds, um, then you, you might want to recommend that we continue allocating sustainability money that way. Um, same thing with his planning. So Chris has explained what we use the FY23 funds for um, and given some ideas of the things that she thinks are coming up. And ultimately, you know, it's up to you to whether you rec uh, want to recommend the funds be allocated for those types of things. But the the projects themselves are for um, not not for a specific project. It's for the projects that might come up. And Paul might want to. Yeah, and I think what's what's important here is for the planning department to be able to do its job, they're going to need to have consultants at certain times to be able to consult with them. And that's what this money is for, is for them, let the, the department head has to be able to make some judgments like, and sometimes the council will give an initiative to them saying like the um, the, the Boltwood garage or something like that. But sometimes it's a, it's a planning department initiative where they feel like we need support and uh, looking at the zoning in a certain area. So this is sort of just a a budget allocation for the for them to be able to to use for certain projects and i think we found it really useful um and very valuable actually yeah thanks yeah i don't i don't take issue per se it's more about setting up the expectations around you know if projects are brought to us and you know that, that isn't where the money goes because something else comes up i guess i just want everybody to be on the same page with sort of what what's being brought to us and what to expect and yeah, just overall what sort of our role is. That's all. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Alex. Pam. Um, yeah, thanks for that clarification. Um, I, I like the fact that uh, the planning director is, is trying to be proactive and putting out in front of us what um, at least at least one of the priorities for a review is. And I, I could certainly support that focus on the East East uh, Amherst area. I'm also very supportive of taking a look at other parking garage locations. So I do support that as well. Paul, is your hand back up or did you just not go down? So I, th I think, think I'm not seeing any other hands up. So Chris, Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. And as always, thank, thank you for the amount of work you do for all of us. Thank you. Bye-bye. So next is the fire department. And there are a couple additional documents put in the packet um, provided by the fire department that give a little bit more explanation um, from what was in the packet originally. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over. Uh, Chief Nelson, are you going to speak to these or is Lindsay? Uh, actually, uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a tri tri triple team. Okay. Uh, you know, we we kind of we we share we share 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 the load the load here. You know, so you all you know so. All right, you have uh, access to share your screen. Um, yeah. If you'd well, like that to our, our little 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 share 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 sharing piece. He's our tech tech geek. You know, proud 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 proudly so so. Anyway. Uh, Let's see if I can pull that off. There you go. Can you see our requests? Yes. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Okay. All right. So uh, you'll you'll see see our our uh, request quest quest there. I mean, I think the best best thing to do is. I mean, we, they, they, I wouldn't say say that they're eclectic, but it, it, there's a whole whole list 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 of thing things there, and I think we we should uh, just 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 kind of kind of go 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 through each 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 one if that if that works works for uh, everyone. Will that uh, work? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So first, first off, uh, EMS training, training, training and equipment. Uh, I'll let uh, Jeff get get to get to get to the uh, the 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 uh, nitty gritty part. But again, this this is some some most most of our work is either EMS and this and this is 
the equipment and train, 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 train to main, maintain or high level, high, high level of service. But I'll let uh, Jeff, Jeff speak, 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 speak to, to, to it. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so this is kind of a, a collaboration with, uh, with actually with Sean. Uh, he suggested I sort of package this together when I came to him a few months ago and said, we have a number of items that we would like to either replace or add um, to help either make the service better or safer for our patients and ourselves. And the hard part is each of them have pretty extensive uh, R&D processes and testing and processes. And what happens is that the price goes up for everything that we, we try to purchase that lives in the world of healthcare. Um, so a lot of these examples are the, uh, the first thing, which is the bender lift. And that is a fairly simple device in a lot of ways. It's a wraparound uh, device that goes around a patient and uses uh, straps. The webbing straps go around. And instead of trying to pick somebody up uh, singularly or off their uh, limbs or legs, arms, um, this wraps around their torso and then has handles. And the two of us can more safely and more correctly lift somebody uh, using good uh, technique. And that hopefully would cut down on back injuries and also make it a safer operation for the patients that we lift. And unfortunately, people have gotten bigger over time. Um, and lifting people is something that we we do on a, on a regular basis. And some of those folks are, are extremely heavy or just sometimes in tight places that making access to their uh, their body parts to lift correctly is really hard to do. Um, but each one of those costs about $800 a piece. And then when you try to put that on five ambulances and, and two first response engines so that we have access to it, that price goes up pretty quickly. And the second piece that we have is an emergency child restraint device that goes on our uh, stretchers in our ambulance. The current one we have is very limited in the, it was the best we could buy at the time. It, the system that we have now is over 10 years old. And the PD mate that we used was actually built for a different stretcher than we currently use. And then what we use, the striker stretcher that we've had that over the last 10 years is built just a little bit differently in, in how it's designed. And we're looking for a system that can incorporate larger uh, groups of children. So from five pounds up to 110 pounds is what this one is rated for. It meets a number of national standard certification that the state has requested we uh, attain. Uh, and again, each one of those costs about $800 a piece. The third thing that uh, we probably ran out of room to show is a sort of a soft restraint system that we use for patients that occasionally are combative. There are patients we deal with that sometimes uh, do everything from hit to bite to kick. Um, they don't necessarily mean to, it's just between alcohol, drugs, um, other conditions, physical, mental, um, we at times have to restrain somebody so that we can safely transport them to the hospital. Um, the system that we use now was built for, again, the previous ambulance, uh, the furnace, and the type that we want to purchase uh, with these funds would allow us to use it on the striker stretcher. It's a much, uh, it's been redesigned and it's been redesigned by someone who works in the field um, and looks like by all indications, we could cut down our time to actually secure somebody uh, with those restraints in half, which instead of taking six minutes to do it, which can be if someone's really pushing back and fighting uh, down to three minutes, and that would be a lot safer for both the patient and for the, the crews themselves. The last piece of this is the most expensive. It's something called the hand heavy uh, weight based or age and weight based. Um, pediatric um, emergency system, and it's a, syst a system that is designed to help the paramedics uh, figure out and calculate the correct uh, medicine dosing for children. Pediatrics is a really tough format because they're probably the least, we probably deal with pediatrics uh, much less than we do, say, someone who is in 60s or 70s that we deal with frequently. We're very used to their drug dosings, we're very used to their care. Um, pediatrics happen very rarely, but when they happen, um, they can be very uh, critical to both the patient and the long term actually affects the uh, staff themselves because unfortunately doing cardiac arrest calls on a two year old is sometimes a long lasting effect and it's tough to do. The current system we use is a length based tape. And so you literally stretch the tape out next to that 
child and then use that to help you make calculations because unfortunately children are not just little adults and we can't just use half doses and sort of guess we have to be much more precise and over time the national studies have shown us that the weight the uh, length based tapes have a lot of inaccuracies because just using length doesn't always give you a good um, sense of how much they weigh which is a much better way to use uh, drug calculations so this is a combination of both using weight-based to, uh, to figure in age to figure out what kind of dosing we should use for our patients, but it also is an element of education. There's a four-hour education block that goes with it. And in addition to having guides that are um, can be in the ambulance, these guides can also be tied to the uh, computer systems we use, and they're integratable into the actual ESO patient care reporting uh, systems that we use. So in this case, we very modular and it's pretty flexible as the state occasionally adjusts our protocols and our drug dosing. We can actually work with Hantebi to adjust the uh, correct protocol based uh, drug doses to it. So all total, I believe this ask is just about $24,000 and it's something we just can't afford typically in our normal operational budget because our normal operational budget budget is very tight and, and used pretty much all the way to the to the nickel, especially when it comes to EMS equipment. Questions? I think we'll go through all of them. Yeah, right, uh, yeah. Jeff, and then we'll do questions at the end. Okay. It works. Come, coming up next, uh, for pumper truck and uh, engine. Uh, one of the keys here is that there's uh, the stand, standard and interface standard is 20 to 20 years on on a front 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 line uh, piece of our, 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 our apparatus, and the one that we want to replace is 2001 vintage. And one one of the quirks of the pan, pandemic, as you all know, is that that uh, delivery times have been 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 extended extended. extended uh, you know the whole, you know uh, the whole uh, supply supply chain thing. So from 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 time of or order to to the time time that that we uh, we we take the to, to delivery is approximately 20, 24 months, two years. So ordering it right now would mean we get we we see it in 20, 20, 2025. Which which puts our the the engine that we want to want to replace at uh, twenty four year 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 years old. So that's that's a big reason. Another big reason why 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 we're looking to 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 replace that. And I'll have Lindsay, you know, go go more 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 in depth. Sure. Um, yeah. As the chief said, this proposal for FY twenty four is to replace the two thousand one. I'm going to jump for a moment to another document that was included in your online packet, um, which is just this timeline here. I know it can get confusing. We have right now vehicles on order from FY22 and 23. We're proposing to you requests for 24, and that ultimately results in multiple ambulances and engines, which you know we're hoping to justify here today. So jumping to this document, it just gives you a quick snapshot of where we are in terms of, I'll, just start with the ambulance, which we'll be talking about in a minute since it's listed first. We do have one ambulance on order from the current FY23 budget. Uh, those are uh, also about a 24 month delivery time, just like the pumper. Uh, we're not gonna see that until the summer of 24, and that is replacing our 2012 ambulance now 11 years old. The ambulance we're proposing in this FY24 budget, which I'll speak to in a minute, um, we therefore wouldn't see till summer of 25, just like the pumper, which the chief mentioned, uh, which is why we're asking for uh, an ambulance two years in a row because of these um, uh, sort of ridiculous delivery times. We used to be able to get an ambulance in about nine months, nine to 10 months from order. Now it's two years. Um, as we look for our capital plan, our next ambulance to uh, 2015 uh, in two years, which is the earliest we could get another ambulance, will be 10 years old. And you'll notice in um, the narrative in a moment uh, what it has for mileage. I'll talk more about that. The pumper that the chief just mentioned, uh, we also have a pumper on order right now. That is from FY22 budget. Uh, it was supposed to be delivered to us this coming fall. 
Unfortunately, we were informed a few weeks ago that that's been pushed back to January 24. It should have been fall 23. Now it's been pushed to January of 24. That is replacing our 1999 pumper, uh, now 24 years old. Uh, the one the chief just spoke about, again, is replacing a uh, 2001 which uh, with delivery times of two years, we'll put that as a 24 year old truck by the time it was replaced in 2025, if we put it in the FY24 budget. And finally, uh, for those of you that were on JCPC last year, you'll know that we also have a ladder tower on order um, from the FY23 budget, expected delivery is summer of 24, that is on track time-wise right now. Um, and that is of course replacing our uh, 1988 ladder tower. So just jumping back to the request, um, this pumper would be virtually identical to the one that's currently on order. A uh, key component being that it um, does have the uh, hybrid uh, zero RPM feature that we just got in our first ambulance a year ago. We're now incorporating into all orders, pumpers, ladder truck and ambulances, uh, which uh, shuts down the diesel motor when you park the vehicle, goes to a battery backup, so cuts on idling time, which is of course a huge use of uh, diesel fuel and maintenance issues. And I'll just finally add that for a pumper truck, uh, just looking at the photos here, don't think of a pumper just as a, a big taxi for firefighters and hose. Um, an integral part of the truck here on the right photo is in fact the pump. And what you don't see is the anywhere from 500 to 1000 gallon tank on board of water. So this is actually a huge piece of equipment on wheels that we need to get to a fire scene. It's not just a way to get firefighters there. So it, it's much more than a, um, a transportation vehicle. And you know what, and I would add, add, I would add to that, that it's, you know, uh, it's, it's our tool tool. It's our toolbox. We, we, you know, we take, you know, we take, we take the whole, the whole team and we, and we bring, bring our tools with, with us. It's not just, as, as I said, it's not just, just, just for, for fire, for fires. We're going to, uh, any type, 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 type of rev, rest, rest, rescue, motor, motor vehicle crashes, uh, get, getting kid, kids out of, out of, the, out of lock, lock, that have locked, locked lock themselves in bath, bath, bathrooms. It run, it runs the gam, gam, gamut. So, uh, it's not, again, it, it's, it's our tool, 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 toolbox. It's our initial water, water, water source. And it's, and it's, it's our way, way to get, get our, folks to 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 the scene of the in, 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 incident go ahead um, that's all i have for the pumper uh the ambulance we just touched on when we looked at our timeline um the one that's currently on order right now out of fi 23 is to replace the 2012 this proposal is to replace the 2015 which um in summer of 25 which is when we would receive it uh will be 10 years old and uh, right now that ambulance has 170,000 miles on it, so it will easily exceed uh, 200,000 uh, by the time it would get replaced under this scenario, um, which is high for an ambulance. Uh, a lot of departments, even privates, are not running them uh, beyond somewhere to the 100, 150,000 uh, mile range because of the abuse they take. So again, we are, we're trying to forecast out needs down the road um, which is why we're putting both the pumper and the ambulance in this year, because there's no, if we postpone them one year, um, there's no way to accelerate the schedule. So we would have to just wait two years to get them. And this would again have the uh, hybrid system incorporated into it. Uh, Jeff, I guess you can speak yeah, to this yeah. one. Yeah, watch it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is. As it says, a lease payment, it's the third year of uh, three years, a uh, lease payment for our LifePak 15 cardiac monitors. That is our do everything cardiac monitor that is required to be in every one of our paramedic vehicles. We purchased five of them at a fairly good discount rate three years ago. And this is just the uh, third installment, last installment on that purchase. So these ones we already have in our possession is the key there. We, we, right. we owe the bill. Right. Yeah, it's a lease. Yeah. We've been using yeah. them it's, for two years. Right, three, yes, year, year three of three. Uh, radios, uh, uh, this is we do, This is an on, on go, go going pro, pro, projects of ours to, to replace our portable radio and mobile, mobile radio radios. Uh, the ones, ones we're replacing, 
20 years old or not support for supported by the man manufacturer and they meet meet meet, meet the, the the current government stand, standards for uh trend transmission and uh interoperability uh when lynch we want to go 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 in deep deeper with them on, on, yeah on just these. uh Quickly to explain what you see here, the one photo on the left, that's just an example of a mobile radio that we'd have in a fire truck or an ambulance or other vehicle. Uh, the picture on the right are portable radios. The one on the left is the old 20 year old model. Um, the one on the right is the new NFPA compliant uh, model, like the chief said, which is um, both ruggedized for firefighter use. The old ones were a business radio and they also meet the standards for interoperability, which means um, basically we can talk to police, we can talk to other agencies um, not just amongst ourselves um, just to give you an idea of costing these mobile radios here for the vehicles are coming in around um, five six thousand dollars per radio these portables this green portable here uh, if i buy it a single band vhf just for fire uh, that's about a six five to six thousand dollar radio if i get it for all bands which is vhf uhf 800 megahertz so we can talk to any agency in the area that's about a $9,000 radio per portable. The prices have just um, skyrocketed over the last few years. So what we're trying to do it is piece by piece. When we order a new vehicle, we put a uh, new mobile in it. Um, sometimes, like the case of our last ambulance, if we have some funds remaining in the capital for the vehicle, we use that to put towards the radios. If we don't, then we have to take uh, the mobile radios. If we don't have any left over, we have to take it out of this capital item we're proposing. And then the portable radios we're doing vehicle by vehicle. Each engine has six of these uh, portable radios. Each ambulance has one or two. So we're slowly swapping them out in vehicles one by one. Oh, wait, and, Jeff. Oh. I'll say, yeah, Jeff, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, yeah I was going to, I was going to ask that, but Jeff, you know, uh, Real, real quick for me, the, we we uh, we first per, per, per purchased these about 10, 10, 10 year, year, years ago, and one of the biggest things about 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 this is saves wear and tear on fire for fire for fighters. Uh, one back in 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 the three. 10, 10, 10, 10 tend to be real, you know, quite, quite expensive, expensive, or quite co 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 costly in term, term, terms of harm, harm to the fire, 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 fire fighter, lot loss, loss to so that fire, 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 firefighter to, 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 the, to, to the town, to the people, to citizens, and, uh, and, it's 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 just a car 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 a back in in, in injury to be a car 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 costly thing as I said and these have saved us I, I, they they saved 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 us a ton and you know we're right now the uh, the point uh, we're coming come coming come to you about this because we're there we had had them for 10, 10, 10, 10 years they're going, they're nearing end of life so but I'll let you, Jeff Jeff go in deep, deeper on 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 these so like the chief said we've had these stretchers uh power stretchers and power loaders so the power powered stretcher is a battery operated system that helps us take um the patient from a low position um and be able to either raise it up to meet them or from a high position down to meet them at their level and then be able to set them on the on the uh stretcher or if two of us had to pick somebody up we could pick somebody up off the, the ground or out of a chair bed etc put them on the uh the stretcher and then use a, a button and the, ba the battery to help power that device to lift up so we could ex extract from the house or a building once we get out to the uh outside if you look on the left picture we then can um the device is hooked together so there's a power loader that brings that stretcher it essentially picks it up and we bring the wheels up electronically and instead of uh, two of us lifting the full weight of a patient plus a stretcher um, physically off the ground like we used to when i started um, and set them in the back of the ambulance this device actually scoops and lifts and then we slide in on a, a trolley system essentially when i spoke to the striker representative um, who sold us whose company sold us these a number of years ago these devices are reaching their end of life they are not very far from being replaced by a new version and what happens is over a short period of time after the new version comes out 
they stop making parts for it. And there'll be a point in the near future where parts will be less available and maintenance and repairs will be uh, difficult to do. Unfortunately, like a lot of other things, these are not cheap uh, in the world of medical equipment. And so this is a fairly pricey uh, replacement, but we do get good use out of them. I would estimate that we've lifted well over, you know, 30 to 40,000 people on these devices over the last 10 plus years. So uh, we've gotten good use out of them. And the uh, there's an AMR statistic out there that says something to the effect that each back injury, they estimate costs about $60,000 uh, per person so that, that was injured. So we'll never exactly know how many injuries we prevented, but we just know that over history and time and, and doing this work that we prevented a lot by decreasing the number of times we have to physically move a patient. Um, and every time, every time we transport somebody to the hospital, we move them multiple times. And this is a big help. I would just add that um, uh, the main thing is that the cost of each one of these, the cost of the, the pair, if you will, the ambulance on the power loader is a little over 50000 uh, per pair per ambulance. We have five ambulances, which is where you get to the total that you see, uh, 261000 Um I would also just add that, Jeff, am I correct that the new power stretchers are actually rated for heavier patient lifts, heavier mm -hmm. patients? Yeah, they've gone to over seven, I think up to maybe as much as 800 pounds a person, which sounds like we shouldn't see. But unfortunately, there are patients that, that are in our community at times that are well over 600 pounds. And then I will tell you that I know of at least one stretcher in Northampton that was um, they overloaded it and actually they had to have that repaired afterwards and, and recertified. And finally, I would just add that, uh, as it says in the narrative, we have, as we've bought new ambulances, we have recycled uh, these loaders and stretchers from the old ambulance to the new a number of times. Uh, so they've, they've all, but I think one of them have served in multiple ambulances. Um, but the vendor at this point is saying it would not be prudent to put it into our new ambulance uh, that is coming, that it's time for new ones. Hmm. Uh, the last two, and I'll go through this right. one. Can I interrupt for a second? Sorry, Lindsay, can I just ask you to go back up to the top of that page so I can catch for the minute so I can catch sure. them? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Thank you. All set? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I know we're getting a little tight on time. I'll go through this next one uh, fairly quickly since it's come up before, so the chief can do the last one. Um, this protective gear, uh, now up to 50000 a year from Cash Capital. This is a recurring item we've had for a number of years now. Uh, this is so we can replace anywhere from 10 to 15 sets of the turnout gear, which uh, pictured here, turnout gear is the ensemble worn by the firefighters. It's the boots, it's the pants, it's the jacket, it's the helmet, it's the gloves. You can see the firefighters wearing it on the right here. Uh, NFPA puts a 10-year lifespan on those. They obviously take a lot of abuse from firefighting as well as sunlight and just general uh, wear and tear between our full-time firefighters, call and student. We have about 100 pairs in circulation in the department, uh, so we need to maintain that 10 to 15 sets a year to stay under that 10-year uh, maximum use. The uh, Mass Fire Academy will not let any firefighters train at their facilities with gear that doesn't meet that 10-year requirement. So this is, a, like I said, a recurring uh, line item to replace that protective gear. We have a small line item in our operating budget, which is to buy incidentals, gloves, hoods, uh, some other boots, some other things that come up during the year. This is to do entire ensembles for um, 10 to 15 firefighters. And finally, our yeah. last item. Yeah, last, last, uh, last uh, item. Uh, so you, 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 UTV, sort of a uh, small, all, 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 all terrain the, the, the vehicle. As you can see, it, we had it for it says 17 years, and it was used when, when, when we first, first, first got it, uh, first received, received, received it. And really, it's, 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 it's used for off, for off road, hold, up on, up, up at the notch, the range, uh, high, uh, hikers at all times of the year. Folks fall, slip. Uh, um, the sprains, break, breaking an, an ankle, things that things of that nature, and you need need this to get out, get out, get out, get out there, 
get get our uh, response folks out 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 there treat treat the patient and get get them back 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 to where where we where we can tra transport them. Uh, it's also great great to use use when when we're go, going out off off road into the woods for brush fire fires and carry our fire 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 fighters right. and 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 tools to get out get out 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 get out get out there. And you'll you'll see that we even we we use it for think things like uh, the block block bar bar party. We'll we use that as our rover rover roving uh EMS vehicle. Uh you know up up and down 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 the 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 event uh venue. So so it's it's got it's got some pretty pretty good good utility they're varied you tell to tell to tell to tell totally. and as we said it, it was new to us so it was 17 year, years ago and when how how i think it was what about three three years old when, when we first first got got, got it i mean it was so that 20, sounds about 20, right 20, okay. 20, so 20 years yeah it was donated to the department um so yeah it already had a few years of use yeah, yeah. so and that is that is the uh the end of the end of the end of our our so we'll ent entertain the uh, questions. Sean, are you going to be the R R R who who goes first? I can. As <laughs> Kathy, you want me to call on people? Um, well, I'm Mandy. sorry, I was on mute. I just called on Mandy's okay. and with silence on my end. Sorry, Mandy. <laughs> No problem. Um, first, before I get to my my one question, I, I want to, since you guys are actually here, I, I want to thank um, the whole fire department for last weekend's responses. You guys were much busier than we expected you to be because um, it was a different sort of response than we've seen in the past. And, you know, you stepped up to the occasion. And I just wanted to say now that I'm in front of you guys. Thank you for all of that and your hard work that weekend and the professionalism you uh, showed. Thank you, thanks. We'll 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 we'll, pat, we'll make 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 sure to pass that along. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I'm curious. You said you had the zero RPM in. I don't know whether it was an ambulance or a truck for about a year now. How is that working? Um, in terms of giving any data, how much it's saving us, I don't think we've had it long enough. Um, overall, it is working well. Caveat is that ambulance has had like just about any vehicle and any new vehicle some mechanical issues, which have caused it to have to go back to the vendor uh, or dealer for repairs. Um, one related to the zero RPM, others not. Um, we're about reaching the point, once you get to about April or May here, we'll have 12 months of uh, use on it. And that'll be a good time to try to look at uh, the primarily fuel usage for the vehicle in that assigned slot. That's our A1, our, number, our first out ambulance at a central station to see what the diesels have used previous years and see what this is used over a 12 month period when it was actually in service, which would, you know, it'll be, we'll have to look at 15 months to get 12 months of use, but um, hopefully in the next couple of months, we'll, we'll have 12 months of usage and we can give you a number on that. Um, anecdotally, it seems to be working well. Um, within five seconds of them parking it on a scene, it is shutting down, um, unless it's incredibly cold or incredibly hot out and um, the AC or heat needs to keep going. So we're, you know, we're seeing large amounts of time when that diesel motor would be running when it's not on calls, which is the whole intent of it. So looking good, but no hard numbers to give you quite yet. So. Thanks. That sounds good. Pam. You're muted. There you go. Thanks. Um, I was thinking as you were talking about the, the pumpers and the trucks that are being ordered that we put ourselves in kind of a similar situation to the existing situation, which is we have several vehicles only a year or two apart in terms of age. And is there, I don't know the age of all of the vehicles across the spectrum, but is there a way that um, we could we could somehow space that out a little bit? So there's always, you know, a truck that's a little bit newer than it's nearest replacement if you will i think that's i think that you know in in our pre present day and i and this is going to go on for, for a while i think i think it's tough to do that because of the supply chain is, 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 issue i think that is for for forcing us to 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 wait we're still 
we're still we're going to be two two years out on uh well no we're a year out on on our um, on, on the last, last bumper we're we're we're, we're going to be two two years out on on, on our next next one so so that i so that that's going to be, be an issue and you know and addition, additionally we you know there's uh we're we're trying 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 to main main maintain a national nationally recognized stance and standard which is 20, 20, 20 years on the front front line in a piece of ab, 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 apparatus so those are issues i mean i get you know we you know, we 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 can't wait. If if you know, without without the pan 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 pandemic, we we have a pretty pretty pretty, pretty, pretty consistent uh, time 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 frame be, between or, 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 or ordering. The, the pan pandemic has made a mess of pretty pretty, pretty much every 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 everything. Uh, Lindsay, why don't you why don't you add add into that? Yeah, just that uh, if I understood your question correctly, the ambulances, we have had um, a, a set schedule, if you will, for um, close to 20 years now, which is to try to buy one every other year um, with five ambulances. If we buy one every two years, that maintains a 10 year lifespan. And that's roughly what we've been trying to keep up with the pandemic. We tripped on that and we fell a little bit more behind. We're trying to catch up again now. Um, we had prior to the pandemic advocated for accelerating that to a seven or eight year lifespan. That's a little harder to do with a year every other year scenario, but we're finding that 10 years they're getting, a, you know, over 200,000 miles, as I said earlier. But right now we do have roughly a 10 year cycle lifespan and a two year replacement. So that's been a little more regular. To your point, the pumpers are a little more clustered. Uh, we have a 1999 being replaced now. We're advocating to replace the 01 here. The next one, if you look at the five-year plan, uh, would be the 03, um, and that's showing up um, not in two years, but in FY27. So it's pushing it a little bit longer than its ideal lifespan, but that's where it is in the capital plan right now. Yeah, th thanks. So there really was, you really are trying to keep them every, like every couple of years. Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the other question I had was about the different defibrillators, and I couldn't tell if we are leasing them or buying them. It sounded like we bought five of them, but we're paying them off over time, or least to least to buy, hmm? least to purchase. Okay, okay, great, great. So we'll so we don't need to turn around and and lease new ones in the next two years. Of those five out of seven, no, but there are two. The other two, six and seven, that will co probably come of age in the next. I'd have to look next couple of years that we'll be looking to replace those two. But this group of five, we will have them for another seven or so years. Great, great, thank you. Perfect. I I just have a couple of questions. One is um, on the techie side. Um, that e hand heavy that you showed us in that yeah. first minute. Um, for pediatric. Um, I quickly looked it up and it looks like it's capable of directly connecting with an electronic medical record, which the doctor on the other end would be getting real, would be getting information. Not quite that far. So it does connect, like I said, to our ESO computer, patient computer system. So our patient reporting on our end, but the hospital does not use the same type of reporting system is different computer code um, than what what we use and okay. that's a answer, my question is whether we can connect with the with the system that Cooley and Cooley's system is the MGH system which is a uh, um yeah it's called epic it's, yeah, it's called they're epic. On, I know they're on epic yeah yeah so that's not something that we're going to attach to directly but it does actually link up to our ESO system and would actually help input those records into our patient care report, which we give them when we get there. Yeah, I, you know, I won't even tell you all I've asked. I mean, in my past life, I looked at the, the Dutch system had the potential of the person out in the field was directly linking back with the record, you know, so it sounds like we've got a, a systems, it, it can almost do it. So it was, it was just a, you answered it. <laughs> Yeah. So then my question is on wear and tear of ambulance in particular. 
um, with uh, building on Mandy's thanking you for what you all just went through last weekend. Um, to what extent we look at UMass and say, you know, um, a whole ambulance can be attributed wear and tear, or we, you know, it doesn't last as long as it might have, and or staff time. And Paul, this is one I know for you because you're in negotiations. And I also wonder with the fire trucks, are they ever going out with the ambulance? Um, and I think in the operating budget side, you said sometimes to help lift. And will the lifting device that you're getting mean that the a fire truck and an ambulance are not going out in an accident? So just trying to think of the staffing impact on you and also the first question was the UMass side. Um, and well, I know, Paul, this is probably more for you. In terms yeah, of the, the, the UMass side. side. So we, we have taken, the UMass side. Yeah, so, so we have taken an approach on that. We have already talked with them about that. And so um, we'll be talking to you about that as well in the near future for in terms of what that, what they can do. In terms of the spending two vehicles for every ambulance call, that would be something for the fire uh, leadership to address. With with that, there's uh, and I'll have Jeff Jeff get get a deep deeper dive, but it's not it's not just the lift, lifting piece that we're where we're send, sending you know a fire fire truck in and and an am, 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 ambulance at the same same time. We found that uh, and and there are studies out 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 there. One particular, I think in Auburn, Auburn Mass, where they found patient outcomes are better when when you're send, sending for certain cer cer certain high acuity calls you're send, sending an, an ambulance and 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 a fire for the fire truck uh what and because we're 98% of our folks are uh, para, 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 paramedics you're what you what you get, you get, get getting at the same you know when when we send to send them to these high acuity calls you're getting more ex more expertise on scene more and 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 that's and that's and that's a big big deal you also you're also you're also getting more 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 hand, hands on, on scene and it's not not just getting the stretcher from the road to the uh to 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 the back back of the ambulance there are times where we have some did Diff, 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 the difficult call carry, carries from from a house saying you're coming coming downstairs and you're coming uh you know uh or, or trying trying to get 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 them up from a ba basement or something like 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 that you need you need a lot more 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 hand, hand hands on 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 scene but one of the biggest thing things is that you you for us we you're 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 getting more a highly trained per, per personnel on scene at the side of the pay, pay, patient, and it's been shown that there are better, better, more positive, positive patient out, outcomes with, with that. Jeff. So I know this has come up a few times, and I really do want to point out that we do are particular about the type of calls that we send more than one resource at a time. Um, those are typically things like chest pain, cardiac arrest, respiratory uh, distress. Um, unconscious uh, motor vehicle accidents are included in that as well. Um, extreme trauma cases. And what we're really looking to do is put the best care in the first 15 to 20 minutes at the bedside of the person. So if you're familiar with a code blue team in a hospital, think of it a little bit like that. And then in that first few minutes, the care we give is going to set the tone for the rest of the call. And that's why we send them together. So it could be expert piece, it could be uh, manpower, it could be move equipment and get, get me things. It could be start an IV or give me some medications. Who's gonna do airway and set up that, that a, a whole format of care. Um, or it could be help me move my equipment and get me access so we can get down the second or third flight of stairs and get out yeah. to the ambulance safely in the winter time. And all these things happen in, based on what we have uh, for situations. So it's been very effective. We've had some good uh, patient care outcomes, cardiac right. arrest saves, really good times for stroke patients, sepsis patients, because we were effective in that first 15, 20 minutes. Thank you. You know, so I think what you're saying is it's the people you're bringing to the scene, not necessarily the two vehicles that you're... You're building. You're bringing a, a skilled team there. So I mean, that's a helpful. And I guess the vehicle you've got is a fire engine. Is the second vehicle is is you know the the interesting pairing here. But, you know, but I, it's I, it's 
it's it's it, it's a fire truck but it's a medic level fire 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 yep. fire truck okay. we have all the tools that we have on an am, 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 ambulance so the para, 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 paramedics can do can 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 do the same thing from the fire fire truck that they would do from an am, 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 ambulance except except tran, tran, transport so okay. that's a, another key. You know, you're getting you're you're getting the tools, you're getting you're getting the vehicles. But the biggest thing for us, you're getting high highly trained for for, for personnel to take care of that patient. That's the key. And and Kathy, I think your point about if, you know bringing a team together is really the important part of it. But the second part is that we're always doing two jobs at one time. We're always have the fire department side matched with the EMS simultaneously together, and it's a little bit about our model and it's a limitation a bit of our both our model and our staffing and if we had as other people have suggested we could take a car if i had extra staff at a station to do that that would be wonderful but in fact if i send the engine one and a1 to do a call on main street for chest pain that is the entirety of that crew that is working at station typically so there's no extra bodies to move to say use a car and send two people out separately. And then if we go to Bay Road, you're 10 minutes back to get a fire engine if we take a car. And we're always trying to manage this 10 by three rectangle that we work in and do two jobs simultaneously. Got it, thank you. That was very, very helpful. Pam? Yeah, we do definitely appreciate the fact that we, we have such really well-trained, um, paramedic capability, it's really comforting. Um, as a number, uh, as a percentage of all the calls that you take in a year, how many of them are actual fires? So that, in, that information is in our budget book um, yeah. every year. So Tim, you can weigh in, but you'll, you'll get updated yeah. numbers on all the call data as part yeah. of the budget process. Yeah, and part part of that that is the way way they're coded for 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 the state as well. I mean, you know, we don't ha uh, we don't have a lot of quote quote unquote fires, you know, but we do have in in we do have a lot of in in instances where they're code coded 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 as fires, but they're not this big spectacular spectacular thing. Pam, I can send you the um the snapshot from last year, so you can just or I'll send it to the whole committee, so you can see that. I'm glad we don't have that many fires. That's a good, 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 good thing. And you know what? Uh, just a, as an aside to what you're, you're, what you're saying, that that is uh, in, in essence of a test test to the fire prevent, prevent, prevention efforts uh, state statewide, and in particular, particular here in, in Amherst, we've been blessed. Uh, for years and years to have folks that are really good at 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 prevention and that, and that's not not just just our prevention officer but our but our uh, the rest the rest the rest the rest the rest for our staff we're all about prevent, prevent, prevention and uh it's it's some, some something we're, we're we're especially proud 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 of thank you sure uh pam to your question a 2022 the 100 series in the national database, so that lists fires that could be, you know, car fires or building fires. That's a, a bigger group. It's it was 74. We did over a thousand, well over like 1,200 engine calls, but of those, the list has fires, not rescues, not hazmat, not service calls, not false alarms. So that's that's about the number. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. It's instant answers. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I'm not seeing any other hands up. Um, so, uh, Sean, I. Yeah. So I'd like to thank the chief and the assistant chiefs for coming. Um, if there's any other questions, you guys can send them, uh, the committee, send them to me and I'll get them to the department to get responses. Sure. But thank you guys and for coming. And you, can right. you make sure Sean gets that set of visuals you, you showed us? Those were- it's in the He's, got, he's got, got them. He's oh, got they're already them. there because yeah. those were excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sure. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Everybody. So next up, Doug, are you going to take the lead on this or Mr. Roy Clark? Roy Clark, I believe. All right. Rupert, do you want to go ahead and start um, running through your projects? Sure. Um, so... Um, 
a number of these are uh, probably familiar to many of the people on. Thank you all for having us, first of all. Um, a number of these are probably fairly familiar because they uh, they crop up every year, every other year. Um, uh, but if I just start at the top of your list, um, uh, we've got Crocker Farm uh, HVAC equipment replacement. Um, this is, uh, you know, the, the building was had a big renovation about 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago. And so the equipment there is, is is aging, it's needing more maintenance, uh, more parts are breaking, more repair is taking place. Um, and this is uh, sort of a typical ongoing uh, effort um, uh, for Crocker Farm. Um, the second item uh, is uh, listed as the Fort River parking lot paving. That's a typo actually. I think it should have been Crocker Farm. Uh, pavement um, and so if the committee is willing I'd love to uh, amend that application to make that second item for Crocker Farm instead of Fort River we do have uh, some FY22 paving money from Fort River that will see us through the next year I think um, uh, the third item uh, Wildwood parking lot paving now, all of this is uh, typically going to be uh, either repairs to um, catch basin drains, uh, pothole repairs. Um, uh, the last couple of years, we've tried to uh, just uh, spread a, a, a smear of, of blacktop over degrading stuff. This is not the kind of money you'd be seeing for a total uh, pavement replacement. This is uh, patch and repair um, uh, in all three cases for the um, in both cases for the uh, paving money. Um, next on your list, the wildwood roof. Um, you know, uh, with with plans afoot to replace wildwood um, and Fort River schools, we still need to keep the building uh, functional, operational, safe. Um, and uh, you never know when something's going to give way in a 50 year old building like that. So. Um, this is uh, sort of an insurance policy to make sure that we can respond if we need to to uh, failures in roof drains, uh, uh, large failures in the in the roof itself, uh, and to just sort of keep at the leaks that sprout up again and again. Um, next item uh, is. Um, uh, more HVAC replacement, this is a district amount um, as opposed to Fort River. It's, uh, it's the intention here is to be able to support whatever school uh, has the need for urgent repairs uh, as well as to um, uh, it just sort of stay on top of stuff as, as equipment goes. Um, we do have a study in place, I'll mention in passing, uh, uh, that we're working on at Crocker Farm to try to get a, a, a view to um, how to transition that building away from fossil fuels uh, and how to incorporate that transition uh, with replacement of equipment as we go. And so uh, once that report uh, is finalized, uh, I should have some more information for folks on that, on that front. Um, the next item is the uh, interior upgrades. Um, actually, uh, it's uh, if you if you look at the project description on the outs on the right hand side, um, uh, it does include some ADA work, some of which uh, could be exterior to the building. Uh, so I'd want to make sure that it was understood that you know there are cases where this might need to apply interior or exterior. Um, to the building. Um, uh, we have uh, the typical annual ask, the next couple of lines, asbestos management, uh, school security. Um, it's shocking to me how expensive uh, uh, um, crash bars and uh, safety equipment to, to get people out of the building costs uh, and how quickly it breaks down it just 
it's just something that we always have to keep after. Um, and also, I think it's been um, a while since we uh, asked for money for exterior doors. We do have some projects going on at Fort River uh, with some money from FY20 they were trying to send down. Um, but I expect that uh, we will need to do doors in other buildings, not just Fort River. And so making this a district request rather than a building specific request will give us the flexibility we need. Um, and, uh, and furniture, once again, that's a, a typical annual uh, request. Um, uh, just to stay on top of furniture as it breaks down and wears out and, and we have no need. Uh, and then the next lines are all vehicle related. So maybe I should pause to see if there's questions on the first half. Yeah, Rupert, uh, why don't we pause for questions and um, real quick, just for those who are looking at these requests and then looking at the plan itself, some of the smaller items have been grouped into the interior exterior upgrades bucket. Um, okay. So just for um, sort of organization and, and simplicity, you'll see that some of like the small parking, uh, the parking lot projects, the um, exterior doors um, have been grouped at that $100,000 number for interior exterior upgrades and ADA improvements, similar to the town's version of that, pro um, of that type of account, which is for sort of smaller uh, uh, maintenance and infrastructure improvements. So um, again, if anyone's trying to, all the projects are there, they've just been lumped into that $100,000 figure. Um, but are there any questions on uh, the facility projects? And Rupert, maybe drop this down just for a second while we... Oh. Thank you. Pam? Do we have comparisons over the years of... Um what our actual expenses are compared to each of these categories. I mean, are the categories I'm guessing or the amounts requested are um, relative to what has actually been spent over the years? It's, it's, I didn't realize that, <clears throat> I guess I never separated out um, maintenance of school facilities. I, and I understand that we have maintenance of buildings, um, whatever that we own. Uh, anyways, has there been a tracking of, of actuals compared to what's been requested each year over the last 10 yeah, years? Yeah, so so once the if a project's approved, it, it's set up as its own account and it's tracked by its own account number. Um, and it stays there until it's either fully spent or turned back. And if it's turned back, it goes into um, a closed capital fund, which then can be appropriated for future capital. Um, so when you look at, there's the the chart and the preliminary capital plan that shows all the items that are three years or older. Um, so anything that hasn't, again, we usually give our capital projects about three years to spend their money. Um, and then we start knocking on the door to close it out or spend it. Um, but we do track every individual account um, and it's all either spent or turned back. It doesn't just sit there forever. Yeah. Kathy? Um, yeah, Rupert, thank you for this. And Sean, I, my question is sort of builds on Pam's a little bit. I'm looking at your sheet, Sean, and I see the 100,000, but you've left asbestos on its own line, school security on its own line, and furniture on its own line. So when the school gets this, if they uh, need more in one of the other categories, is it a flexible amount of money that we understand what we're doing is for maintenance in the school? Um, so I don't know which I would shift it at. If you needed more in asbestos management or you right. didn't spend as much in school security, you know, so you've got a few of the 10,000 and 25 are still separate. So how yeah, so the ones, the ones that are specific are specific. That's what they'll be used for. The one that's broader, the interior exterior upgrades, um, and ADA improvements, that one could be used to, um, you know, supplement uh, an asbestos um, mitigation project, for example, if it needed to be. Um, okay. of, the, of that 100,000, about 50 are for specific projects that uh, Rupert reviewed in his um, his plan, which was the, the parking lots and the um, uh, exterior doors. And then the other 50 is sort of the general 
again, like the town has for things that come up throughout the year that break that need to be addressed immediately. So that 50 um, uh, in particular is flexible, um, but really it's, you know, it's up to Rupert to allocate those funds to the projects that come up throughout the year. Okay, thank you. That answered my question. Mandy. Yeah, um, I'm looking at the projects that are three years or older list and um, trying to figure out what remains there and what's on the request this year that could be fulfilled by what remains there. And it's kind of hard to say because right now it looks like at least 85,000 of it from 2019 titled new equipment is just going to be returned to the town. Mm -hmm. Yet, I think we have a line item. Do we have a line item in our current budget for sort of equipment for schools, or we have one for IT for schools? Wouldn't it fall under that one so that instead of returning it to the town for us to full future allocate, couldn't we not allocate something this year and use the 85000 that was allocated for new equipment in 2019, FY19, for that? And then I'm looking at a lot of building improvements from FY20 um like over four hundred thousand dollars and they all just say in progress and so i guess my question with that one is do you expect to use all of that money um or only a portion of that money such that what is actually needed for building improvements this year given the fact that we don't have enough we have to find ways to eliminate some of the programs on this year's capital budget because we're about three hundred thousand uh, not in balance this year. And so could someone speak to those remaining projects that are on this schools list on page 21 of the proposed plan? Um, and what money of that isn't actually being allocated that maybe some of the requests this year could go to? Doug, do you mind if I take the first one and then take the second one? Um, so your first question, um, Mandy Joe, about uh, the closed new equipment. So we typically don't directly shift those closed um, capital projects for something else. Um, but what the committee certainly could recommend if you want to is we do have a gap. If you, when you're done reviewing all the projects, you decide we think you should do all these projects. Um, you could propose, you, you know, uh, using closed capital funds um, to help make up that difference. We're not, you, we're not proposing any right now. Um, we wanted you to kind of go through the process of hearing all the projects and making your own determinations. Um, but again, if you go through this and say, we don't, you know, we think you should do all these next year, they're all urgent and ready to go. You could make that recommendation to look at the closed capital fund to, to provide, I don't know, I don't know if we'd want to pull out 200,000, but we, um, or whatever the gap is currently, but we certainly could look at it for um, certain projects. And then Doug, do you want to speak to the, yeah, you can, whatever you'd like to. Yeah, I can I can add a couple of things relative to that. I think the the one thing under the project description is very broad in that in the in the report, and obviously you know the the thing that uh, we try to be uh, cognizant of, and are certainly part and parcel of the of the appropriation that you guys do, is that these are for specific things a lot of times, and so there are limitations on what can spend it. So sometimes even within something as broad as as uh, interior improvements, if we specify you know painting of a gymnasium or something, then we really have to spend it on painting of a gymnasium. So we do. Do have some limitations that's some of what you're having there i think the other thing is you look at some of those fiscal 20 uh, uh spending um i know that some of them have been closed out like uh literally in the last few days because i was working with sonia to friday when she she, she retired. <laughs> retired she wasn't going to leave anything unsettled that's for sure she was not i was annoying her by being slow um but excuse me but i also think that that um that there are some of those that were, were literally, I, I think one of those accounts got hit uh, with a request today from, from Rupert as they're trying to get projects uh, completed and working on those. So some of those will get spent down a little bit more over the next few months as we as we try to button up a few more things. But but there's certainly some of that that's that's going to get returned um, and be available for you to use. And and we'll try to you know refine that and have you know that that amount of funding available to help you you know close that gap of that of that three hundred some thousand you're talking about. So um, hopefully between you know. Uh, uh, resources we can free up and, and some flexibility that others may have on projects we can get you where you need to be. Thanks. Rupert. Uh, I just also like to um, piggyback on uh, some of what the fire department was saying in terms of um, uh, 
procurement and and uh, how long it takes to buy things. Uh, that's part of the problem that we're having, uh, uh, just sort of getting these projects going. Um, I've ordered vehicles and waited six months and then told we're not going to make them, place another order for the next model year. Um, you know, I've put projects out to bid and everybody's too busy. Uh, ask us next summer. Uh, so there's a sort of a bunch of logistical issues that get in the way. Um, we're certainly trying to do all the projects that we got funding for in prior years. And I recognize, you know, that it makes sense uh, where we can't accomplish that, that we may need to turn it back to the town to be re reallocated. Uh, and I think that, that that makes sense to me. I think that's the nature of of, of municipal finance in some regard. Um, uh, but I'm certainly willing to, you know, look at the, that FY20 money and go, this is not likely to be spent, but it's a good insurance policy. This one, we, we have projects, we're just trying to make them go. Um, uh, you know, the, like, for example, with, uh, with roof money for this year, it's like, I'm hoping I don't have to spend any of that roof money that we're asking for, but I don't know. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, I definitely appreciate that you want to make sure that we're able to fulfill the projects that, that we ask money for. It's been particularly challenging uh, with COVID and, and all that other stuff. So thank you for that. All right, so uh, Robert, do you wanna go through vehicles now? Oh, sure. Um, uh, you can you can reshare your uh, screen. I think that was Doug doing that. Oh, sorry, Doug. It was me, but I will share my screen. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm gonna, make something bigger on my screen here. Hang on just a second. There we are. Sorry about that. I can't I can't read that little screen on my laptop that has a camera. I have to put it on my other screen. Um, okay, so vehicles. We have a number of vehicle asks. Um, and um, I guess I'll just go through them in the order that you see them on your page there. Um, uh, the school bus, this is a $450,000 ask uh, for an electric school bus. Uh, we did indicate that there's uh, grant money that may be available to support this. Uh, the way this particular DARA grant works is we have to purchase the bus. We have to get it on the road. We have to purchase and install the infrastructure. We have to get it operational. And we have to prove that we have destroyed the diesel bus that's being replaced uh, as the terms of this grant before they will send us the money. So the ask is for what we expect the full amount to be uh, rather than what the final cost uh, will hopefully be. Um, one of the other restrictions uh, with this particular grant is uh, that they've determined that the federal government should only be in line for up to 45% of approved costs. And we're, we're, we're excluded from using other federal money to supplement. If there's state grants or private grants or whatever, that's great. Uh, but we can't use the federal, other federal grants um, to support that electric bus purchase. And it, together with that is the next line, which is the fast uh, electric bus charger. Uh, what, we, what we found is that uh, because of range limitations and charging time, uh, the level two charger, which is the less expensive version, uh, just does not work for us with our one electric bus. Uh, so really, if we're going to get an electric bus, we also need to get an electric fast charger uh, for it to be workable. Uh, and so those two things really need to be paired together in folks' minds. Um, um, beyond that, oh, and I will just point out, um, uh, typically, uh, School buses uh, are taken off the road uh, after 10 years, uh, 100,000 miles. Uh, right now we have three buses that uh, have over 10 years and over 100,000 miles. I've got one bus that I ordered, uh, I think it was in July last year. Hopefully we'll get it before the end of this school year. Um, uh, I need to order another one. So if we don't get 
uh, an electric bus and charger, I will need to order a diesel bus uh, to keep our fleet up and running. Uh, so just sort of keep that in your back of your mind, please. Um, and um, the other thing I'll say about that is uh, back in 2008, we bought two school buses the same year. Uh, and so that puts us in the squeeze to replace uh, two buses at the same time. I'm trying to stagger them out a year apart just to make the cash flow better for uh, for capital purposes. But um, uh, we definitely need uh, to replace some buses. We're having a hard time keeping them running and safe. Um, special ed vans. Um, we had some money uh, in a prior year for special ed vans. Uh, I ordered the two vans and then six months later they said we're not going to be able to produce them uh, and we can't guarantee the price so reorder the next uh, model year and we only had enough money to order one instead of two so I have one on order um, uh, and um, this amount here I think is to make up the difference uh, for that request a couple of years ago that wasn't sufficient to buy the two vans um, yes, that's correct. And so then next down is the maintenance vehicle. All of our, uh, our service vans are, uh, over 10 years old. Uh, they're quite beat up, uh, and it's, we're long past due, uh, trying to replace at least one of those. Uh, then, uh, closing down near the end, Amherst portion of non-electric vehicle charging infrastructure. My vision is uh, that you know our our service vehicles and hopefully eventually our special ed vans uh, will be electric, uh, and we need to start building the infrastructure for that to happen. Uh, that's likely going to be a different come in a different form than the bus chargers, uh, and uh, so this is pulled out separately to help facilitate getting a start on that project. Then the next item, electric bus upgrades and battery replacement. Uh, I believe our E-Lion is capable of having five batteries. We bought it with four. Uh, we were told at the time, um, adding it, each battery is about $30,000. Um, typically electric vehicles, as I understand it, uh, batteries start to fail after about eight years, which is where we're at now. And that was the source of this ask. This has been in our plan for, for several years. Um, uh, so this is, I don't know that the batteries need to be replaced. Uh, and the reason why I don't know is partly because you don't know until they fail. Uh, but the other reason is that this bus has been out of service uh, uh, since last spring. Uh, we've been unable to get repair parts for it. Uh, we're trying to uh, work with the manufacturer. Um, but until we get a new monitor screen and possibly new controller, we won't be able to access the diagnostics to see the condition of the battery. And then the last item, I don't have anything to say about district technology equipment. That would be Doug. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago with when Jerry Champagne was was with you all. So that's been covered in a previous meeting. So questions about the vehicle. Mandy. Take to be going first the whole time. I'm trying to <laughs> give others an opportunity. So these vehicles are being proposed to be purchased by the town. What, how much of the time is the vehicle used for regional transportation, seven to 12 transportation? And then for the vehicle chargers, both the bus chargers and the non-bus chargers, where's the planned installation of that? Um, I know the bus currently, the buses are currently housed on region property. 
Um, and so could you talk about where they would be installed, where all of this infrastructure would be installed and whether there's any cost sharing planned with the region on any of this in case the buses or the vehicles plan to be used for region transportation too? Uh, well, I can take a stab at some of that. Um, uh, the uh, service vehicles, uh, the service vehicle request uh, does serve all of our schools, all six of our schools, um, and all of the vehicles are housed on region property. In, in my vision, that's the best place to locate uh, charging infrastructure. And I think that that's part of the part of what we're asking of the of the region towns is to participate uh, with us as a partner uh, for that for that charging equipment that would go on region property. Um, in terms of the uh, the special ed vans, those are used primarily for Amherst Elementary. Uh, but uh, we do also use them for some secondary special ed students. Um, and in terms of the buses, uh, there's a complicated um, relationship that we have uh, be for the region and with uh, state funding for the region, which I don't pretend to be able to explain. I don't know if you can help on that one, Doug, when you stop talking. Yeah, I can, I can provide a little more information there. Um, so on, on service vehicles, we actually, the region does own a couple as well. So, so those are both, both districts uh, share those a little bit. Um, so we try to kind of cost share by virtue of ownership by each, each district of, of some of those vehicles. I think with the SE vans, again, to, to Robert's point, most of the driving for those uh, SE vans are for elementary students. There are some region students that are involved and certainly uh, do a, a process of billing uh, the district back for, for some of that time. Um, we don't specifically charge the the um, mileage uh, or uh, you know sort of vehicle use charge in in regard to the SE vans because it's it's generally been and and continues to be mostly uh, elementary students that are on those SE vans, um, and then like he, like you said in the uh, in the overall transportation picture we have a, 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 a an evolved um, process by virtue of you know kids and miles and towns and. All of that sort of stuff that we use to sort of appropriate costs and and expenses across uh, all four of the communities that, that play into the regional district. Can I follow up with that? So I I'm unclear though with the buses and the replacement bus batteries. It sounds like you're asking for the total cost to be borne by Amherst, and then there's some sort of billing or something going on I, I and and how does that I, I guess I'm I'm just still unclear how this all works does Amherst receive money from the region like the town for this cost if we purchase the vehicle totally and then how does that work with the charging stations too Doug do my, my recollection um was that the buses bought by Amherst while they may support the region, they're only used for Amherst residents um, because the buses that go up into Levern, Shrewsbury, or Cosmascus, uh, well, formerly Cosmascus, um, and now I assume Five Stars, the the one contractor we have. So the at least historically, the buses that do the routes in Shrewsbury or Leverett or even Pelham for that matter um, were our contractors' buses, which that contracted cost was shared among um, among Amherst region and and those other. Um, the individual elementary school districts pay a share of that as well. Um, so for the buses that the town operates, at least historically, those buses were only used within the bounds of Amherst. So that's why there was never some billing back and forth with the region because they were only really used for Amherst um, students. But so Amherst is buying the buses that are used in Amherst, but through the regional budget is also paying the transportation costs for Leverett, Shootsbury, and Pelham, in addition, a portion of that, 80% of it, because it's in the region budget, as well as 100% of the transportation costs for just Amherst students. Is that's where the correct? No, so that's where the mileage comes in. So for the contracted transportation, 
Amherst will pay the share for of the the Amherst miles, for example, of that contracted transportation. Um, yeah, so the, the transportation system in our system has never been clean. It's probably one of the most confusing things about working in our in our little. Uh, and you can ask Doug; he, he has experience with it now. Um, it's probably one of the most confusing things about our system because we have, you know, we have two elementary school districts and a regional school district that are served by the central office here. But our transportation system also serves the elementary schools of Leverett and Shutesbury Elementary, um, which are not our school districts, but we try to come up with the most efficient efficient system that we could um, in terms of getting the economies of scale. So I encourage you maybe to swing over to Doug's office someday. Doug can walk you through the, uh, the transportation workbook, uh, which was the reason why I left the regional school district because uh, <laughs> it was, uh, uh, it was uh, you know, it took about two days, uh, two full days and 12 spreadsheets and uh, a lot of work to complete every year, um, not only to figure out the billing, but also to figure out the, um, we, we have to report all this on the end of year report. And there's a, a schedule of the end of year report specifically focused on transportation um, and trying to divvy that out for all these different individual school districts takes a lot of work. So um, so again, I think, it, I won't say it's per, a perfect system, but I think the rationale in the past for why Amherst owns the vehicles is because they're primarily used on Amherst students and the ones that serve other towns are contracted out. Right. And and, and, it's will... not, and, it, and the other ones don't only serve other towns. They serve Amherst students and the other towns. It's it's not like the other, the, our contractor doesn't transport Amherst students as well. Um, it's just the ones that we own is somewhat based on the number of staff we have. Um, and those ones primarily serve Amherst students. That's right, and and so the costs associated, so it's the operating costs and the capital costs on this, you know, in in this, and so the uh, the operating costs that are owned by Amherst or any of the other four communities in the in the regional schools all pay their piece of that operating cost, um, and then the capital costs again, the buses that are used uh, that are Amherst owned are used for entirely for Amherst students, and so. Um, if there are operating costs related to that, that's a portion as it needs to be, but the, but the actual capital cost because they just transport Amherst kids by and large um, are, are borne by the town of Amherst. So I see Alex's hand is up and then Pam. And Alex has joined us all the way now. Hi, Alex. Hi, thanks. Nothing worse than trying to uh, talk over a phone. Um, yeah, I just, I have two questions. One, um, I guess, is a follow-up to a question that I asked uh, probably in the first meeting. So if I understood correctly, the way the grant works is, you know, we wouldn't, you wouldn't get the grant until, you know, all the, all the box are checked. And so, you know, again, I think it's fabulous that we have a grant, but for me, that means we're taking money away from the capital budget and for other departments that then comes back at a later date. So I don't know if there is a way to sort of fund what we, because the grant was already awarded from what I understand. So we know what the amount is. Is there a different bucket it can be pulled from so that we're not taking away that money from other departments? And then- yeah. the Second, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just saying, and then my second question was, you know, I've noticed that over the last couple of years, we've sort of moved into giving each department sort of a, a bucket of money, 50,000, 100,000, whatever it is, to address issues that may come up throughout the year. And as we're trying to cut out, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, does it make sense to instead have a smaller pot of money that's sort of centrally located that departments can request like, is there a way to sort of be more cost effective in terms of creating that sort of emergency bucket? So I'll start with the first one. So, um, and this was a miscommunication on my part. So if you look at the capital plan right now, what's in there is the net amount. So we will need to find another source um, or increase the gap here for the portion that is the grant. So, so, so that is something we will have to do. So to your point, I'll come back next time with a, some creative thinking around where that other source might be. Um, but if we do, I think first we want to, part of that specifically, we wanted to hear the JCPC's thoughts on, um, is that how you think we should allocate roughly $400,000 of sustainability funds? Um, I think I, in our my initial comments when we first presented the, the capital plan was, this is a big allocation of, 
of sustainability funds. And one of the things I always struggle with is how do we get the most bang for our buck when it comes to sustainability investments? Um, and just wanted the committee to weigh in on that, whether you think this is the, the right direction to go in. Um, so I'll come back on that. And then the second one, so are you talking, is your, um, your question, Alex, whether we should lump some of these pots of money and and have somebody be sort of the arbiter of divvying it out? Yeah, I mean, I'm wondering, can we have, uh, you know, if I don't know what the total cost is, but if, you know, fire is getting 50 and school is getting 50 and, you know what I mean? Like, instead of having sort of $250,000 across all the departments that's there if they need it, could you have a smaller amount of, say, 150? Or I'm just wondering if that's a way that we could sort of cut in this budget, but still. Yeah. So, so the, the accounts that we have that are like that, there's one managed by Jeremiah, uh, who manages the town facilities. There's one managed by Stephanie Ciccarello, um, who, uh, you know, specifically focused on sustainability improvements. And then there's this one managed by uh, Rupert. And so in the, you know, in the once upon a time, we had one facility director that oversaw all, all town buildings. I think what you're proposing might have been simpler under that structure when we had sort of one uh, individual overseeing everything. Um, you know, it's something I would have to talk more with Paul about, but it'd be a little bit more complicated because we have, you know, our facility management is separate now between the school and the town. Okay. So I, I guess what comes to mind, obviously, for me is, should the library be putting 50,000, you know what I mean? Should we be including this as well? Because we never have, and we all know that we're sort of, well, hopefully we're going to make it, right, until until things happen. But we, I think, are all pretty aware that mm -hmm. we have some potential emergencies so, yeah. that are coming up. And so if the approach is that, you know, we need to be including that, you know, hopefully you and Sharon are having that conversation with Paul, but I, I guess I just want to be, yeah, I was just hoping it was a way to, to cut out some money uh, mm -hmm. if we needed to. Okay. Pam. Yeah. Yeah, that was actually an, uh, a more articulate way of the, the question I was trying to ask if, you know, if there are leftover funds in some of these sort of general pots of money, are we really tracking to make sure that they were all needed? Or was it just, you know, kind of a nice general number that goes to, you know, indoor maintenance kind of thing? So that was a better way to ask the question. Mine are questions are really more about the buses. Um, two questions. Is there some kind of formula to, to require a certain number of buses for a community? Or do we or do we get by buses um, <clears throat> as uh, as need dictates? That's the first question. The second is just how many buses do we have and of them, how many are electric already? Uh, shall I answer? Okay. Uh, so, um, since I did it here, I came the beginning of 2019, and for a long time before then, uh, we've had seven Amherst-owned, Amherst-run bus routes with nine vehicles, bus vehicles, um, so that we have uh, typically two spares, and I think that's kind of an industry standard. If one bus breaks down, you need to have one ready to go out there and pick up those kids and get them home. Uh, and if one bus is under repair, you need to still have a bus able to go out and pick up kids that are stranded someplace. Uh, so seven plus two is the number we've been using. Um, out of those nine buses, uh, one is electric. Um, and then all of our other bus routes are run through contracts right now with Five Star, previously with Five Star and with Domestic. Um, I'm not sure if I've forgotten some questions, so please. please that's, uh, that's good as far as as far as the quantities goes. But is there who tells us how many buses we need? Are these buses full? Are um, what's the basis for the number needed? So we try to arrange our bus routes so that um, everyone's bus trip is less than an hour and elementary kids' bus trips are less than half an hour. Uh, so regardless of whether the buses are, you know, every seat is filled or not, uh, we need to develop a certain number of routes to cover the geographic territory. Um, and that, I believe, is the basis of 
of uh, the primary basis of how many buses we need is uh, in order to get kids to school reasonably quickly. And the schools have a software that you plug in all the enrollment every year um, and a transportation coordinator that, that works with Rupert to make the, the bus schedules every year. So every year it's a fresh look at who are the kids that need bus transportation that year. So I see, Doug, I see, is your hand up on this also? Yeah. Yeah, the only thing I wanted to add was just with nine buses, we're, we're basically on an every year, replace, you know, one per year replacement cycle with one year off every decade um, to, to replace nine buses. So because about a 10 year lifespan is, is, uh, is the sort of uh, preferred uh, time of, uh, and we require that of our, our vendors, our third party vendors as well. And are these are these routes? I mean, are we? I guess it doesn't matter if there are three kids that need to be picked up or thirty five kids that need to be picked up. Um, I just answered my own question. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Doug. Yeah. I was just going to say, uh, you know, we're we're if if you know technically uh, if kids live more than a mile and a half from school, we're required to provide transportation to them. Um, so that's one one piece of it. Obviously, we try to be efficient with the buses and fill them as much as possible. But also, to Rupert's point, you know, to have the length of of time on the bus uh, be uh, reasonable as well. So, you know, the goal is to have you know each of the buses pretty full and be able to get from you know sort of start to finish in the time frame we're we're looking to to do it in. And and part of that's just for the kids, but part of that's also just because of of the way our schools you know days are structured and the time of of uh, classes starting is also a critical component in that. And so with the with the shift to the in the uh, secondary schools going with a later start and trying to flip flop those schedules, that's been that's been challenging. But but nonetheless, um, you know, that's that's part of that calculus as well. But but we definitely try to get, uh, you know, we want the you know, we don't want a, a big bus driving all over town with two kids in it. I mean, you know, other than the last two kids on the last stop. Right. Um, but generally, yeah, we we have a fairly balanced uh, number of kids on the buses and and try to keep the routes uh, length of time fairly steady as well. Um, just uh, the, I had two questions. One for the contracted buses: Do any of the does the place you go do they do they offer electric buses at all? Because one of the things I see is how expensive if. If we're replacing our whole fleet, we have some major expenses in front of us. So it's it's just a question of what's available for contract. And then um, um, during the elementary school building um, meetings, one person who lives on Strong Street was commenting on the buses going by, Doug, with three child children in them or four children that some of the ridership was down, I think, because of COVID, that people were driving their kids to school rather than putting them on the bus. So my question is, do you have to have a full-size bus if you look at the ridership and you never have more than 15? Can you have a smaller bus? Or do you have to have a full-size bus in case every kid who's on the route decided to ride the bus? So I just I know there are rules you have to abide by. So I, I just got a sense of how much of a straight jacket you're in. Yeah. I don't know if Rupert wants to take that second one. Um, but <laughs> well, I shouldn't I should have called it a straight jacket. It's just, you know, this is we, this is the math. Here are the kids, here's where they live. And yeah. I think the other thing to consider is that we also use these buses to do field trips uh, whenever possible. Mm -hmm. When we can transport our kids, it's a lot less expensive than when we use our contractor. Sure. Um, so we definitely try to leverage that, uh, you know, that feature and functionality whenever we can. Um, I'm not sure our enrollments dropped to the point where we're quite ready to start using slightly smaller size buses. I mean, I think that that gets a little tricky in the sort of overall scheme. Uh, but but at the same time, I think it's, you know, as we, if, if our enrollment continues to be, to, you know, decline or, or reduce further than what it is now in our elementary district, we'll, we'll have to consider that as a possibility. Um, on the question of electric buses with our vendors, we did put in a, uh, in our last bid, uh, in our last contract um, request for, for proposals, um, we did put in, you know, uh, an option. We wanted them to price, uh, you know, sort of electric buses and what that would be. Um, it's, it's still a pretty new area for everybody. Um, so they, uh, of the people that bid, only one actually put in a price on that. I forget what the number is now, but I want to say it was, you know, 
200,000 or 250,000 each year, kind of an add on because they, they priced the buses and went, oh my God, we've got to cover this cost plus, you know, everything else. And so I think we're not there yet. I think we'll see, and I think there are a lot of districts in a lot of communities across the Commonwealth that are like, how do we electrify our fleets? We're working with these third parties. I mean, most of them don't own their own fleet, so they really have a lot less control, but they want to partner with and encourage their their vendors to 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 become electric. And so it's a it's an interesting uh procurement and and uh management problem to to solve. So it's you know, it's one we, we keep looking at, keep thinking about, keep uh listening to our colleagues and see what they're doing and, and how we might encourage our our vendors to to offer that as a as an option. So uh, I see Mandy, Alex, and Rupert. So I don't know whether Rupert, you want to build on what Doug just um yeah. Yeah, so just uh just to add a little bit more to that, uh we're obligated to have a seat available for every kid that's eligible for transportation, whether they choose to take it or not. Uh, and some of them will choose to take it only when it's bad weather or only when uh, grandma's on vacation and can't drive or only when something else happens. It's not something that we can predict and it's not something that we can require people to sign up for um, and say, yes, I, I, I'm going to do it and no, I'm not. Um, so uh, we really do have to have capacity there. Uh, and just as another sort of picture painting, we recently had an all school field trip from one of the elementary schools to the Mullen Center. Uh, we didn't have enough full-size buses to support that. We had to bring in Five Star and pay them their rates uh, to supplement uh, what we did just to get one elementary school uh, to a uh, women's basketball game at the Mullen Center. Thank you. Mandy. So the buses that you're asking us to purchase for the elementary school, what percentage of time are they used for regional transportation? Not just Amherst students that attend seven to 12 in the region, but regional sports games, uh, regional field trips, things like that um, is question number one. And question number two is um, if we pay for the charging infrastructure and it goes on region land, who actually owns it? And when the buses charge using it, who pays for that electricity? So the electricity would be paid for by the region. That one I, I know the answer to. Um, it's tied to the middle school account. Um, if the town of Amherst paid for it, but it was on the regional school land, that one's a little tricky. I think we'd, we'd probably have to work out something um, in writing. I mean, I would like to say the town of Amherst owns it, but it's, it is technically region property and it's stuck to the property. So we probably have to have some sort of something in writing, outlining ownership. Um, yeah, or, or maybe some sort of, you know, 100 year lease kind of circumstance or yeah. some other arrangement. This is this is where our legal counsel earns their money, I think, in some respects. Yeah, we've got a little bit of maybe Kathy remembers we were, we were thinking about putting the geothermal wells on the middle school land as part of the, the school right. project if if it went up at Wildwood. So I think that's what we were thinking about with that was that there had to be some sort of agreement and easement or something like that with between the the two entities um and then the first question i think that's that would be a rupert question of how much uh these buses get used for regional activities regardless of where the student lives yeah i don't know that i have a very clear answer for that um both for the contractor and for our drivers uh, we run a two-tier system, so we do two morning runs and two afternoon runs, elementary and secondary, elementary and secondary, and that's the most efficient model uh, for our size district uh, to operate under. Uh, so in that regard, half of the routes for the Amherstone buses would be uh, grade 7 through 12 and half of the routes for um, uh, so, so half half of the time the buses would be half of the routes are regional, half the routes are, are elementary. When it comes to um, field trips, uh, the basic structure that we have in place is uh, we make a bus available for a 
field trip from a school uh, on a scheduled basis, uh, which we share. And so um, five days a week, uh, I think uh, the elementary schools outnumbering the number of regional schools uh, means that, that uh, they get a bigger share of the opportunity. Um, uh, for field trips that happen during the school day. Um, but there's a lot of give and take and, you know, the high school will swap one of theirs on Thursday for uh, for an Amherst one and Amherst will swap one of theirs on a Tuesday for regions. It's it's a sort of moving target, which I don't feel like I really have a strong answer for you. Um, and then um, outside of that, uh, uh there are athletics and other secondary field trips that happen outside of school hours um, um, and once again uh, we don't have the staff or the time to support all of the needs of the athletics department so they end up um, using contracted uh, buses as well as ours uh, so we're not carrying a full boat uh, on the Amos buses uh, so I don't feel like that's a satisfactory answer. It's just the best that I have. Oh, Alex. Thanks. I guess <clears throat> I want to circle back around to sort of Sean's question, I guess, about is this the best use of the sustainability money? And so I guess I have two questions to that end is one, um, you know, has Stephanie weighed in in, her, in that in terms of, you know, CO2 output and like what, like where are we really getting our best bang for our buck? And the other is, you know, I think ideally we have an electric um, uh, group of school fleet of school buses, but I'm curious if the technology for school buses is to the point um, where it makes sense to be buying them. Because I think we've had... Like I've had an electric car for 12 years. It's never been in the shop. I love it. It's great. But it doesn't sound like that was our experience with our electric bus. It sounds like we've actually had the opposite. So I'm just wondering why I hate to buy another diesel bus. Like, do we need to wait a year or two for the technology to really make sense for purchases of this size? And I and I don't know the answer to that question. So Rupert, do you want me to start? Um, so that first bus that we got was really almost a first generation, second generation electric bus. There were no companies that we typically do business with making them. And so the company was a, a, a E-Line out of Canada, which is one of the reasons why it's so hard to um, get repairs and get parts is, I don't know, Rupert, how many times you've had to send it back up to Canada to be worked on, but it's, um, or they've had to send somebody down. But um, that was one of the reasons why that was, it was a very early version. Um, and I think they've had more issues just with the interface, like actually like turning the interface of the bus on than the actual bus itself. Um, but um, the bus that they're looking at here is one that is a company we regularly use. It's a Thomas, right, Rupert? Um, they've uh, come around and created their own version of electric buses. Thomas buses have always been, you know, one of the one of our preferred buses that we use. We use a number of different vendors, but that they've always put a really reliable bus out. Um, and then there is a uh, another Massachusetts town that I think is already using them that we can get input from. I believe Beverly, right? Rupert, uh, Rupert has some of these. Uh, they're called Julie's. Is that Thomas Julie? Um, yeah. I think they've true. got some that they're using. So we have some uh, experience that we can call on that we didn't necessarily have with the E-Lion. There weren't a lot of electric buses in cold weather. That was one of the things we found when we were trying to find vendors to to bid on that first electric bus is that a lot of the buses back then were in California or warmer parts of the country. Um, there weren't a lot that were tested for cold weather. Um, and I think the, you know, my just biggest concern with this is the, the price is so much more than a regular bus. I mean, you don't see this with cars, right? You don't, an electric car is not four times the price of a regular car. Um, so I just don't know, I, you know, it's probably because of the scale that, you know, there's not enough scale yet with electric buses, but you know, they're almost, they're sometimes more than four times the cost of a, of a, you know, a standard bus. So at this point, you know, we would have to dramatically shift the budget around in order if we were ever going to have a fleet like this, where we were um, either through leasing or through buying them outright, it would be a dramatic shift in how the budget is allocated um, to maintain a whole fleet if the price doesn't start to come down. Um, and Rupert, anything you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, I just, I would add there are uh, three uh, major U.S. school bus manufacturers. 
Uh, E-Line is not one of them. Uh, their strength lies in other areas. Um, but both Thomas and uh, Bluebird have come out with electric bus school buses and have been running them um, for a couple of years now. Um, and uh, they have, uh, uh, both, both companies have New England branches that can service uh, or do emergency repairs much more easily than one in Montreal. Um, and um, I think the fact that they've been in the school bus business for so long uh, makes me feel a lot better about them. Uh, I, I would not be asking for money for an electric bus if there's gonna be another lion, um, to be honest. Um, I do agree with Sean, it's a big ask. Um, I guess, uh, I mean, in an ideal world, um, if we could provide a small electric car, uh, if we could buy, I don't know, eight of them for the price of one school bus, that's probably a bigger impact, but who's gonna drive them? Who, how do you decide who's gonna get them? You know? uh, that's, that's the problem. It's not, it's not the greenest solution. It's trying to move the needle in a green direction, I guess is the way I would describe it. Uh, I don't know if that helps at all um, with your thinking. Thank you. So I'm just, I'm conscious of the time and it's three o'clock. We have some public with us um, and I just wanna, uh, I will check on whether anyone, if the people are in the public, but raise their hand if you want to make a public comment. Yes, there is one person. And then just to remind people next week when we come together, um, I think Sean will come. We, he can say more of it by email, but next week is when we start to pull together what we've heard and think about what's gonna be in our report. Um, and we started out, so part of this discussion is the budget that came to us was not balanced. There's a $260,000 gap. So all of this re revolves around, you know, uh, what are we thinking and are there any places that we see places to um, provide recommendations? So I'm not going to say any more about that because I do want to call on the one person and then we can come back and I'll get comments, but I don't want to go too much over three o'clock either. So Sarah, you have joined us. Sarah Ross. Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, appreciate all this thoughtful discussion around electric school buses and they certainly are a large price tag item. And I, I wonder, I know we've um, heard from, uh, Beverly was mentioned, I know we've heard from electric, Highland Electric fleets before and would love feedback, Rupert, from you or Sean or others on whether that's a viable option for us because, you know, they will, they will provide the buses. We bring the drivers, they provide the bu electric buses, install the charging equipment as I understand it. And, you know, we'd get 400 or 570K back in this tight capital budget and avoid having to make a, another big upfront investment. So would love to hear your thoughts as I learn more about that model. Yeah, so we met with, so Highland um, Electric is a company that um, they have a leasing type model where they will um, provide the, they'll, as, as Sarah mentioned, they'll provide the infrastructure and they'll help the uh, school district come with a leasing plan where they'll phase out the um, fossil fuel burning buses and bring in electric. And so we met with them maybe three months ago now. I mean, it could be longer. The time goes by so fast, but um, we met with them and and they uh, gave us a nice presentation. And, um, and so I think we are still, unless you tell me otherwise, Rupert, uh, the next step with them was we had to provide them some data and they were going to come out and do a site visit um, before we could get a proposal um, of what it of what the costs would be and what the what the model would be and I don't know if uh, the date if that has happened yet so uh, Doug or Rupert I don't know if you guys have scheduled the time with them or or where that went yes they I did send them a bunch of data and they did come out for a field visit um, uh, we had some lengthy discussions about what portion of the fleet we would want 
so to convert to electric and how many years we would want to spend doing that mm -hmm. uh, and that becomes a more complicated financial question uh, from from my perspective in terms of operations i would like to see you know the successful rollout of of, a, of one bus before we committed to you know half the fleet or more um uh so uh, i just I, I i don't i don't have 100 percent confidence that that you know going with a eight bus electric fleet at this time may be premature or even a four bus electric fleet may be premature depend uh, based on you know our usage and our field trips i mean we have field trips that go out of state they go to boston uh up into new hampshire and vermont um and the range and the charge time becomes a big challenge so um so i think in terms of highland uh there are questions about you know uh the financing and the cost effectiveness that that i don't know how to answer uh in terms of commitment i feel like you know i'm anxious enough with the e-line experience uh that i don't feel 100 percent behind jumping in with both feet uh, to a you know a four fleet commitment say so i'm just going to suggest we usually don't try to go back and forth i think it was a great question sarah so um maybe sean segueing into next week you can just give us a few sentences about this you know and 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 what to what extent there is an option um in a response to the question and comment um because we are, um, so, so thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much for, for raising it. So, um, Kathy, can I say a couple things about next sure. week? Absolutely. Um, so next week, um, I'm planning to bring back uh, sort of the compilation of the questions that you all have raised throughout the first or the last three meetings, including today with responses. Um, I'll try to get it in the packet ahead of time so you can review the, uh, the responses. Um, I'll also there were a few updates that we needed to make to the plan. Uh, we talked, you know, for recreation. We talked about um, there was a project that was proposed that wasn't in the original plan. So I was going to update the plan to include um, that. It was the top dresser. Um, I'm going to look at the I'm going to look at the electric school bus and whether we need to make any adjustments there to reflect the full cost. Um, and then the other thing I'll bring back is um, Paul now hearing, you know, all the presentations and your input. Whether Paul has any suggestions of things that uh we might you might want to consider as part of your recommendation because i think just hearing the presentations and hearing your thoughts there's things that um i can already think we might want to shift around or change a little bit so um, we'll share those with you as well and then you can uh do your deliberation so th that would be great and i just um not everyone has seen whatever we've sent to sean i mean i know mandy sent some i sent and one of the questions i had and this would be coming back from paul is is there one vehicle on this larger vehicle list that we could wait a year on or not you know and, and then the second question was roads there's a clamor out there among residents about roads and i know jen you're already updating the the budget we had because it only had you're talking about a million in it so just if you can come back and speak to some of that it would be great and anyone else who has something that didn't come up, but you're think have you been thinking about it, send it to Sean um, so that we can have as full a discussion next week um, for what we're going to put in our report. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands up. I see Pam's hand is up and uh, yes. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> so being the new the newbie on the block here. Um, so we have the the FY24 proposed plan with um, all of these items individualized, each line item, each each item. Is there anything else that I need to look at that is um, gives me that that bigger picture of you know, all the vehicles, all of the all of the requests in one location there's so in the plan there's that um you might want to review the inventory um that's at the end um 
you know, that gives you a sense it's broken down by department and has the details. So that'll give you a sense of the age of the fleets um, that you can relate to the projects being proposed. Um, and I think that's probably, I mean, related to the vehicle specifically, that's probably the only other thing okay. available. No, and, and then the other thing to keep in mind, um, we have next week, and I guess you put, penciled in the following Thursday, but we have to write a report and um, it's our recommendation to the town manager. So next week in particular is where we're starting to, other than saying we love what you proposed to us, you know, uh, it, you have our blessings, you know, on are there suggestions, are there things we want to emphasize? And Sean, I do think we need to hear back on the resident proposals because we- Oh yeah, that- so that was, um, sorry, finish, I'm sorry to cut you off. I just, because um, during, when we met, uh, DPW said they hadn't actually looked at them. They had a a concept response right. on each of them. So trying to come back to them because that was that very first meeting. Um, and Stephanie did respond on the one, the, the bike station, but we didn't have any on the ones that were, were more roads. Right. Yeah, no, we'll bring back thoughts on that, but I think and hearing a little bit more about it, I think the thing I'm hearing most is that doing individual street uh, safety improvements for one part of town or one particular street may not be the approach that we want to bring to uh, improving safety in streets. And so JCPC, so I think we'll have thoughts around how JCPC wants to think about safety improvements more broadly, how you might include that in a recommendation. Um, there is the there is that uh, transportation planning account that we already put fifty thousand dollars in, which is used to do studies and engineering work. Um, and I, and again, I'll talk to Paul more, but I think we're leaning towards, you know, the best way to proceed would be to have a more comprehensive study of the entire town and what type of uh, safety improvement should go where, um, as opposed to uh, picking one particular part of town. So I, I think th that would be a good discussion, and people might look at last year's report, Pam. You, we had a fairly long discussion about resident proposals on if we have them, and they're going to always end up being told you have to wait because for the big plan, or you have to go here and there, you know, s send you around. Why do we have a resident proposal? So I think th that it gets wrapped up because they are often around roads, sidewalks, crosswalks, speed, speed, you know, so there more of them have been in that so so i just think that's part of this yeah. large discussion so with that said you know doug doug and doug and rupert you stayed with us thank you very much we didn't thank even you. tell you you could leave but thank you very much um and and i'm glad you're going to try to keep those schools functioning uh for a while anyway so any any other final um thoughts and you you can definitely just send anything through to Sean if you have some, um, including would you clarify certain statements? It would be great. So I will see everyone next week. We are adjourned. Bye, all.